Hello, everybody. Welcome to Investing 2020s. I'm Kirk Spano, and I am back from California uh, via Phoenix, Arizona, where I think I got bronchitis. So I will have to pause every now and then to have a sip of my uh, green tea. Just want to talk to you about the trip and get into some investment ideas that I think are going to be pretty important uh, going forward here. But let's uh, start with Wild Goat Bistro. This is the only restaurant that we went to twice. And it happened because we went as we were driving through Sonoma to get to Jenner, where we were going to stay and where I was going to propose. Lots of interesting stuff here. Uh, But we ate at Wild Goat Bistro and it's awesome. So if you're in wine country and you stop in Petaluma, which they call Luma, uh, go to this place because not only is the food great, uh, but they have some desserts that uh, really were, were pretty exceptional. We, on the second time we went, met a couple of clients and I brought Jolene with me uh, and she talked to uh, uh, the wife of, of, of the couple mainly and they seem to have hit it off. Incredibly interesting people, um, marketing uh, analytics company that she owned, uh, my client, they're actually both my client, um, has some loose affiliation with uh, with uh, the Sopranos. Uh, pretty interesting story there. But really talked investments a little bit. None of the conversations really actually went into investments a lot. It was a lot of getting to know each other. Uh, but this is the only place that we ended up going twice because that couple suggested here. So we ate here twice and it was great both times. Now we got up to Jenner and this is where we stayed. Uh, we had a pretty neat view of the ocean. I think that was actually my cabin. And uh, there's harbor seals in here. This is the restaurant where I almost proposed. So uh, I'll get to that story because I know you're just dying to hear that one. Uh, but fantastic place. Highly recommend it. Jolene and I went on a couple of uh, wine tours. And this place, uh, Deerfield, I actually joined the wine club because they have a pretty wide range of not only their wines, but this is a giant cave where they store their wine and several other wineries in the area. So their wine club is pretty awesome. Uh, If you are going to pick out a wine club, I would check this one out. It's uh, pretty exceptional. Here's Jolene and I in the cave. And uh, I suppose at this point, since we're already past Jenner, I will tell you why I didn't propose. So first off, uh, the ring did not get finished uh, for a number of reasons. Unfortunately, my rig designer's father died, and he basically wasn't um, super available for a while. And I was confused as exactly to how to design the ring. So I did the smart thing and I uh, asked her for input. And we were going to get proposed up here, right there, just about. Uh, But something happened. We went to go get a shirt after having lunch here. And you will never believe this, but the guy helping me find a shirt who owned the store, we were talking and uh, he goes, oh, yeah, uh, River's End, it's a great restaurant. I go back from time to time. It's where I got engaged. So my smart future wife goes, oh, is that where we're getting engaged? And I was like, well, Jesus, what is going on here? So apparently I'm Mr. Subtle and uh, she had the whole thing figured out. So at dinner that night, I said, look, um, I told you I wasn't going to propose because uh, I didn't want you to you know, think it was a done deal. And I told her I didn't have the ring. I said, that thing with the shirt today just put me over the edge. Well, this is where I was going to do it. And she just started rolling. She was laughing. She was like, so now you have to take me somewhere else nice? And I was like, yep, I guess so. So when I do propose, and I know that she never listens to these, uh, it will not be some grand trip. It'll be something important here in Milwaukee. So it'll be coming. The ring should be here in July when I get back from the World Series of Poker. So that final news will finally happen in July or August, whenever I actually have the ring. The other winery that I really liked was this one, Laxton. It's a little place. I didn't join the wine club. I just ordered a case. Um, They don't have as many varieties, but what they have is really good. So I ordered a case. Um, I'll probably not drink it all because I think some of these are going to age very well. And, uh, and I say that as a novice with wines, but I do understand the investment value of certain bottles. And I think that this place might have a couple that add a zero, you know, five, 10 years down the road. I do know that this place is going to be up for sale in about four years. The owner, um, 
is an investor. The guy running the place has a lease with option to buy. So we'll see how that goes. But probably next year, I'm going to contact him, especially if we have uh, a recession. Vince just chimed in. I hope the lesson you learned is that you'll never outsmart your woman. Yeah, I already knew that. Um, but, you know, that just means that it has to be a spur of the moment thing when I propose, right? I just have to carry the ring around for a while until I get that spot. And then just, you know, drop to a knee because uh, she made it very clear that I better beg. In any case, uh, Loxton, great uh, winery, good little tour. Um, you, pre- you pretty much just sit around, drink wine and talk about wine and He discussed the different uh, climate things here. The guy who runs it was a physicist, PhD, working at the University of Illinois, and at like 40 years old, he's like, "Ah, I don't want to do this. So he moved out to Sonoma after visiting. Uh, His dad is in Australia, and he's a a vintner, right? He runs a a vineyard and makes wine. And so, uh, yeah, this is uh, where he is. And I would say... If you want to order some bottles, this would be a great place to get a uh, get a case. All right, other stories. Well, I started out with a couple of YouTube videos. One was poker, and the other one was the new Mel Brooks movie, History of the World Part Two, which I'm going to try to watch this weekend. And I, I put those up because I have a client, and I don't dox my clients, right? I don't really look into people's background because I figure that it's a privacy issue at some some level. And I want to go in with kind of a clean slate and let them tell me the things that they want to tell me. And so I knew some things about him. We've talked a few times on the phone and he's been a client, I think around a year. And and I wanted to go out and meet him uh, and, and the other people that I know uh, who are clients and uh, investment letter subscribers around San Francisco. And it was one of the best lunch conversations I ever had. In fact, the reason I mentioned Mel Brooks uh, the other day in the chat room is because nothing that I heard on the whole trip knocked me off my chair except one thing. Uh, I, I try, you know, after the whole New York experience I've had, I, I try to keep it even keel and not get uh, <laughs> awestruck. Um, but I think that the lives that people live are really interesting. So I love hearing the stories. And ultimately what I do is, you know, largely storytelling. And he said something at lunch. I made a comment um, after he said something. He goes, yeah, if you really want to see the stars, go to the commissaries. And they're all just sitting there eating. And I go, you know, there's been a couple of Mel Brooks movies where he has the shot inside the commissary. And I know uh, Blazing Saddles was one. And I think it might've been History of the World Part One. I don't remember which other movie he did it in. But yeah, there'll just be stars sitting there. And, and there's no reason why they would jump into the commissary. They're in a whole different time, right, in the movie. And I said, yeah, it cracks me up uh, when I've seen Mel Brooks do that and just show the commissary. And he goes, here's the line that almost knocked me off my chair. And I did, I kind of sh- I kind of bumbled my glass of water because it was in my hand. He goes, oh, I was just writing Mel a letter the other day. That was the only line that made me go, huh, I did not expect to hear that. So I didn't know. Because like I said, I don't do background checks. Uh, I just knew that this guy had something to do with uh, producing the first World Series of Poker broadcasts. Uh, you know, and he knows I'm a poker player. So he brought that up early in our conversations because he knew I'd think it was super interesting. Uh, I did not know that he was really a, a great <laughs> documentarian. And and I found some of his work there. And I've actually ordered a, a DVD. So he should know that that's been ordered. Uh, but yeah, it's... Uh, It was a great trip, and I was able to ask him a couple of things, and just because in my head, I want to become a better storyteller, because I have a few other stories to tell, and maybe you hear of them someday, maybe you don't, Uh, but I broached the idea of writing my novel online uh, and releasing it a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of time. He, he he immediately picked up on it, so it was kind of funny. He goes, oh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle method. I go, yeah, Sherlock Holmes, that's how they did that too. <laughs> so anyway, guy, you know who you are. You kind of blew me away. Uh, you'll, I'll be sending you a note soon. Uh, other conversations. I mean, I, I met with a, a Microsoft guy who, you know, told me a lot about the company and he's been telling me a lot about the company. You know, we discussed AI and a side project that he has, right? Side project working on AI. Think that one through. You know, my side projects when I was younger were, you know, working at a, meat processing plant on the weekend and 
you know, you know, laying some concrete. So, there, you know, there's a lot of people to mention. Uh, one in particular I do not want to forget uh, was a guy from Chicago who's my age who landed in Silicon Valley uh, in 1993 or four, I think it was. And he's the one that introduced us to Ametis. And he was the person who accompanied me to the meeting with Ametis, uh, where I finally pounded the table one last time. Uh, we will talk about Ametis at the end of the program today uh, because they had big news. And he was nice enough to just drive me around Silicon Valley and tell me stories. And this is what they do. This is what they do. Um, this is why it's built like that. You know, the biggest buildings are the super richest companies, but everybody else stays under four stories because otherwise you have to do the earthquake mitigation. It makes the buildings more expensive. Samsung had one of the biggest buildings. So that was interesting. And, you know, this guy is pretty accomplished. He's seen Silicon Valley grow. His first job was at Intel, where he was on the same floor as this guy, Moore's Law. So he bumped into Gordon Moore all the time when he was uh, younger. But we uh, got to know each other a bit better. And I just have to say thank you very much for the tour of Silicon Valley. I knew it was big. I didn't know it was that big. It goes on forever, you know, from San Jose all the way, you know, to just, just outside of San Francisco. I mean, it's just so much stuff. This brings me to San Francisco on the round trip. And I will tell you, San Francisco is still a great city. I know I ranted about it a couple weeks ago uh, because the homeless and drug problem uh, in parts of the city are out of control. I mean, just over the top. It's like, I mean, this would be a great place to shoot a documentary uh, if it hasn't already been done because the, the drugs that we saw just being done in the street. You know, one guy had a car table set up uh, right across the street from City Hall. People were wrapping their arms and shooting up. And I can only think that this is a massive failure of government. And I have confirmation of that because, you know, here in Milwaukee, and I forget which city we copied, we've gotten rid of like over 90% of our homeless problem here. So there's a way to do it. It may not be super polit politically popular sometimes because I know that a lot of people want to say, well, give them a drug test and then we'll help them. Well, if that's what you're going to do, you're not going to be able to help anybody. So it's a process. It can't be a line in the sand. It's got to be moving them along versus yes or no. And I know that here in Milwaukee, uh, it was not a very publicized program. They kept it on the down low and they just fixed things because otherwise it would have gotten all kinds of rhetoric, right? People would have thumped the table and said, I don't want to do it that way because I'm a moral high ground person or whatever. So there is a lot going on in the city. I, I will say the restaurants are still unbelievable. I walked around Chinatown for the first time ever. Uh, that was really fun. We stopped at like three different places to taste the food. Uh, I, I don't remember the name of the Szechuan place we went, but it was really good. That's a, a bowl uh, that I put in my picture gallery, which was just full of spices on the bottom. Had I eaten all the spice in that bowl, I would have died. Um, it, was, it was way too hot for me, and I like hot food, but just just a great uh, experience walking through Chinatown. I didn't know it was so fun. I like the little open markets and everything else. So if you haven't been to San Francisco in a while, I don't know that you want to go just now because uh, it was cold. You know, so you might want to, uh, you know, remember the old line, the uh, coldest winter I'll ever live through a summer in San Francisco. Uh, you know, it was cold and rainy. But, you know, at some point they're going to fix that city. And one of the reasons why I was there, other than visit clients and do a vacation and, you know, in theory, get engaged, was to look at the real estate. And the real estate market there is very interesting. So I went to, oh man, 20 buildings and checked them out one morning when I was walking around uh, before I met with somebody downtown. And it was kind of amazing to me how far down the prices have come from when some of these buildings uh, last sold or were built four or five years ago. And this is something that, whoop, there we go, right? There's a, a Bloomberg article that came out yesterday that I posted in the chat room. Office and apartment building values drop. I don't know that the apartment buildings are going to stay down, uh, but the office buildings, they're falling through the floor. There's one building in San Francisco. Uh, I don't know if this is the, the picture of the right building, but this building uh, was a $200 million dollar building four or five years ago got priced down to 100 million that's 50 percent and it, it still hasn't sold so it looks like the selling price is going to be 60 70 million 
Uh, that's what they're targeting now. So the banks are going to have a hard time. And we're getting into the investment portion of the show. And Elon Musk just warned that the next year or so are going to be tough uh, for Tesla, but, but car companies in general, because the banks aren't going to be so easy on lending for cars. And I don't know if that's completely true, or if that's just a way of lowering the bar for Tesla so the stock continues to perform. But if we get a quarter with low car sales in the next quarter or two, I think that that'll be a huge opportunity for us to really expand our holdings. And maybe we finally get Tesla. Uh, as you know, uh, or you may have noticed, Tesla uh, has a promise from Elon that if you own Tesla, you'll get a chance to participate in either SpaceX going public or Starlink going public. And that's one of the reasons I want to own Tesla. I think it's going to be another, you know, it's going to go back to a trillion dollars at some point because of all the different things they do. And, you know, that's more of a Monday stocks and options topic. But, you know, I do think that Tesla gets back to a trillion and we have exposure through some of the funds. If we can get, you know, close to a pivot point on the bottom and maybe when it was down to 102, I mean, maybe that's as low as it goes. Uh, at the time, it looked like it was heading to, you know, between 40 and 80. We'll see. So if there's a pullback on Tesla here, the next couple quarters, you know, we'll probably have to start scaling in about halfway back to 100 from here and then, you know, figure it out if we have to buy lower. Uh, somebody mentions that George Soros just liquidated his Tesla. Yeah, I saw that. And Buffett wasn't very positive on the car companies either at his annual meeting. So Warren Buffett said he can't tell you what the car industry is going to look like in five and 10 years. Well, Uncle Warren, I can Right, that, I think I'm gonna write that article. Buffett can't tell you about the car industry. I can, right? You know, nothing like a great arrogant headline to uh, get people to read, right? Um, I think that what I've been telling you since 2020 is just simply coming true. I believe that the car industry by 2026 is pivoting to become dominated by EVs, and by 2027, when the first ICE vehicles get pulled off the market through 2030 you're going to see EV sales go from 11% of car sales to making a run at 80%. And maybe that takes till 2035, but it's going to be that sort of a curve when you look backwards a decade or 15 or 20 years. So somewhere between 2030 and 2035, 80% of passenger cars will be EV. I say passenger cars because that's an important distinction. The heavy machines, the bigger trucks, are going to be very much more purpose-driven. <clears throat> So if you need a work truck in town, hybrid might be the way that they do those. Ford is already on that. Hydrogen engines um, in certain places make a lot of sense. I don't know that they make sense universally in the United States because it's such a large land area, but local and regional fleets might decide to go hydrogen uh, because they don't have to worry about refueling out in the country somewhere, right? So over the road, I don't think that goes hydrogen. Uh, anytime soon. I think you have to see the local and regional uh, markets develop first, and that's going to take a very long time. Um, then maybe oh, 15, 20 years. I mean, it, it could be a really long time before you have hydrogen fleets that are over the road uh, for, for big trucks. Uh, you might see trains go hydrogen, right? Because they have a, a localized way of refueling, but you're just not going to see a network of hydrogen refueling across a big country like the United States. In other places like Japan, they probably can pull it off. I think there's maybe a lot of islands that can do it. Uh, countries that are small, um, where you know, you're know you not driving very far, we'll see. Uh, EVs at the passenger level, I'd say from pickup truck size down, uh, are going to definitely be EV. The in-between size, right, when you have to carry heavy stuff, that might go hybrid and um, hydrogen, like I said, for some local, but natural gas is still out there as a viable option. It's going to be very purpose-driven as to what your fleet of vehicles is trying to do and where it's going, how far it's going, where it's located. So those are all interesting things. So the, the green hydrogen story, I think, has a lot more play in energy storage than, than anywhere else. So keep an eye on that. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll find out over time. I do want some exposure there. You know, we do have a, a company that is part of that transition from natural gas to hydrogen. 
And then we have a backdoor pipeline play on that. So there's a, a lot of ways um, to play this energy transition. And I'm trying to find the ways that give us the biggest run- runway, the least amount of risk, the most certainty uh, without gambling. And I know that people think I gambled on a Metis, uh, but I knew what was going on there. And that is, you know, the key to the game is don't spread your bets so thin that you don't really know what they are. Uh, there is a value in focus, which is why I tell people put about half of your money in ETFs and about half in stocks. And for folks who, you know, are accredited investors, you need to mix in private equity and private real estate because those are great asset classes that on the private equity side offer huge upside when you can buy the bottom of the cycle. And with real estate, you know, as long as you're not buying, you know, in the top 10th or 20th, you know, 20%, top 10 or 20%. Uh, of that market, you you generally get bailed out by real estate over time and you generally get income. So real estate right now is super interesting to me on the commercial side and on the redevelopment side. So that's really where I'm going to focus a lot of my, uh, most of my non-qualified money. So I I put my stock market investments in my IRAs, uh, my SEP IRA and the Roth that uh, luckily caught a couple big winners and is good size now. Um, and then my other money, I really am excited about real estate. So when I get the information about the capital raise that the private equity firm uh, that I'm involved with, that you know, invest in real estate is ready to go public or not public, but be offered with advertising and has the spec sheets, uh, I'll make I'll, I'll make an ask on that to anybody who's interested. But right now, the company that I work with. Uh, that I solicit for, I guess, is uh, raising $20 million uh, and is going to raise another hunk of money. And their two big projects are building a subdivision outside of a major hospital that's been expanding and buying distressed commercial notes where they can get them for, you know, 50 to 70% off the uh, par price. So when you think about that tower in San Francisco, that's going from 200 million to 70 million, that's the sort of thing they're looking for is, okay, how much of a discount can we get with the idea that over a period of time, it gets back to that top price. And that top price might not happen for five, six, seven, eight years. But if you de-risk it by buying near the bottom, and then you do your rehabbing, and I think a lot of the commercial buildings have to go 30, 40, 50, 70%, 80% or completely residential, uh, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a long-term process. So we have to be mindful of the time frames. But man, if you can get some of this real estate on the dirt cheap, I mean, you're pretty much guaranteed to double your money in most cases. In some cases, you might triple or quadruple your money. So buying the bottom of the cycle is really important. I know people ask me about REITs. The problem with REITs is that they're loaded up with fees. I think if you're an accredited investor, you probably want to look at private real estate deals and just accept that you're not going to have a lot of liquidity for a while. Uh, if you have a portfolio that can allocate hundred grand or more to a real estate project that you're not going to get any money out of for five years, I think that these are great ideas for you. For those of you who have to stick with REITs because you're not a millionaire yet, you know that there is one REIT right now that I'm really interested in, the one that's laying in the weeds. Uh, and I think that the news that's been coming out lately about crops getting destroyed uh, in the vegetable markets, I think, and, and wheat uh, completely supports my backup thesis on that stock. So it's either going to sell something high margin or something else high margin. They, either way, they win. And it's just a matter of at what point can you get it at the right price? It seems to be chopping along. The chart looks like it might have one more slide down. <clears throat> but then I think that's it. So let's take a look at debt deal. McCarthy says that debt deal is close and predicts a house vote next week. I will say that the first vote probably fails and you might get a really good down day to do some investing. Uh, But I think that a lot of those investments uh, have to be focused. I think they all have to be focused Uh, and and you have to consider that they might end up being short term, you know, and you might not want to go, you know, hundred percent invested because I don't think that a debt deal getting done sparks a huge rally. I think that this reality is what we have to deal with for another year, year and a half. And in this environment where interest rates have largely normalized, remember I talked about the great normalization, 
this is a process, not an event. And I think it's going to take time and you have to be very specific about the opportunities you want to take. Again, commercial real estate. Coming out of recession, small caps usually dominate. I'm still not sure that we're going to get a recession. Uh, and, and I still think that if we do, it's short and shallow. So I really like the small caps that quarter after quarter have been moving towards executing their business plans. And of course, some of the ones that we got into a year ago did not execute their business plans and we failed. But you know, I, I really hated the management in a couple of companies. Open Doors management is, is, is dog shit. And um, on track, I don't know what the heck happened there. I mean, you talk about a great idea that they completely destroyed. But you know, we want to use certain events to our advantage. So we could probably sell some puts next week. I think that might be an interesting way to play some of these, but I'm still trying to recycle my cash every month or two, right? Meaning that some of my cash is wholly secured puts uh, becomes free as those puts expire. And so I like to keep recycling re, uh, that cash and just keep generating premium because at the end of the year, if you keep rewriting on 20 to 40% of your portfolio with the cash secured puts, I mean, all those five and 10% premiums that you get, say every other month, I mean, they really add up. I mean, that those are huge gains. And, and, and honestly, and if you wanted to just sell puts on hundred percent of your cash, hundred percent of your portfolio, and you had the gumption to do it and, and stay that up to date, I mean, that's a pretty easy way to make 30, 40, 50%, um, in a lot of years, uh, the down years, you get stuck with stock and that's fine because then there's an up year and you make money that way too. So for every one down year that you might have, yeah, three, four, five up years. So that cash secured put strategy, I just tell you, it is something not to flirt with. It is something to marry. Okay. But she still needs flirting. All right. Anyway, shooters plug and play stocks. Um, we did some uh, updating to the way we're writing it. And so now it'll go on margin of safety as well. Here is the ETF one from today. And I just want to show you a couple of uh, ETFs. Now, this is one that you may love, hate, or just trade, which is my deal. Uh, as you know, I'm not a huge Kathy Woods fan. I think that her vision of the future is broadly correct. I think her understanding of trading and economics is not. So this is purely to me a momentum fund. From here to here, you didn't want to own it. So you take a look at the top 10 holdings and you see who they are. And you say, okay, if we get momentum up to here, you know, basically making back half of the decline, you know, that's a pretty good trade. So I don't look at this as something to own forever, um, but I think it's probably a double or triple from recent prices. If you bought it down in the 40s, you know, you're pretty happy. The pullback looks like it's going to be right here, about 48. This is where I would probably add to it, unless really bad things are happening in the world. You just need to look at the top 10 holdings here. I mean, that, that's what you're doing. You're buying a basket of those top 10 holdings and hoping that we catch momentum. Um, if you don't like the fact that she's not a great trader, well, I guess I would just counsel you this, is she just pours into her top ideas. So if you like the top 10 ideas that she has, which are like 70 or 80% of the portfolio, then go ahead and, and ride it from time to time. But this is something that you may trade at, you know, two, three times a year, you know, not, not a buy and hold forever. Right now, this portfolio was super heavy, two things, Bitcoin and Bitcoin related stocks and e-commerce. I love both of those themes. I think that e-commerce just keeps expanding. I think you see some consolidation in that space over time, which is always good for prices. I think that you see the systems with the AI increase their margins, probably. Amazon is doing that. And Shopify, you know, is building out websites for practically every company in the world that wants to sell online, but not go through Amazon. So there's neat things there. Square is a major holding. Coinbase is, and they're beat down pretty good. Uh, you know, that's a stock that could really get destroyed uh, even more if they get hammered in court. Uh, they shouldn't get hammered in court. But again, fighting City Hall is difficult. So uh, somebody asked about Arc F. Um, I've pretty much gotten rid of that one. I use Arc W if I want Bitcoin exposure via Bitcoin itself through the Grayscale Trust and several of the companies that are related. I don't use Arc F because I'd rather just buy three or four stocks, right? It's the Bitcoin component that I use for managing a portfolio uh, that 
my regulators really don't want me to get directly into, which I tell you to just buy your own Bitcoin. But this is a way in an IRA, in particular, in an IRA, I would never own this um, long-term anywhere, but it's particularly good in an IRA uh, because you get those runs and you can trade it and lock in those profits. And you can't really do much for Bitcoin in an IRA, right? You got Grayscale and we've talked about that too. And there's inherent risks there as well. So in order to get some Bitcoin exposure into an IRA, there's only certain ways that you can do it right now. And the Bitcoin story, right? Here's some storytelling again, is this. And I repeat it and people doubt me and it just keeps coming true. You need to understand that the dollar, and you've seen these headlines, the dollar has been weaponized. It hasn't really been weaponized. They just used it as a is a retort to the Saudis and Russians and, and the Chinese for messing with oil and messing with supply chains. And the dollar was pushed up to fight off that inflation and keep people's standards of living in America high. Imagine what would have happened if they let the dollar decline into the face of inflation. It would have been horrific. I mean, it wasn't great, but it wasn't horrific. So the strong dollar is going to continue to be strong. It's going to trade in this higher range now for the rest of the millennials' working career, for sure, and maybe forever, because a currency is based on the productive capacity of an economy, which encompasses things from safety to resources to technology to labor force, rule of law, property rights, all of it. I wrote about this way back in 2012 on Market Watch when everybody said the dollar was going to oblivion. I said, nope, it's going to go on a bull run. Here's why. And it happened value of the dollar has done nothing but go up against other currencies for a decade. You know, there's some small exceptions, but against the other big currencies, the dollar has been winning against that basket. How do our enemies, frenemies, and emerging markets insulate themselves against a dollar that's strong all the time? They basically are using Bitcoin as a way to kind of bind their currencies and economies together as a hedge against the dollar. What do I mean? So China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, think of them as Star Trek characters. And I talked about somebody with this a while back. Who is Saudi Arabia among the Star Trek characters? They're the Ferengi, right? The Ferengi just cared about money. They were amoral and they just wanted a bigger buck. They wanted more money. That's who Saudi Arabia is, at least the House of Saud. They don't really care about much other than rich. They want to be rich and they want to be in power. Russia, who are they? They're the Klingon. Right, they're, they're the Klingons pre wharf but there is a wharf era coming in Russia. What do I mean by that? Now, I know not everybody watches Star Trek, but the Klingons were the warriors. They were the ones that just, you know, just pillaged and got into wars and caused trouble, always angry. And then the Klingon in the Next Generation series, Worf, became a Starfleet officer, joined the club. In his older age, in the Picard series that just ended, he was a violent pacifist. <laughs> I'm not really sure how else to put it, but he discovered meditation. And I think their day is coming in Russia where they finally do completely flip the page, right? Gorbachev was the test. Putin was the, the withdrawal from that test, right? The pullback towards communism again and dictatorial rule. But Russia's had a taste of Gorbachev and... That's going to come back. I don't know who the person's going to be. I don't know how it's going to happen, but they are going to move forward probably in my lifetime. And that will be an investment opportunity when that day comes. Who are the Chinese? Come on. Somebody's a Star Trek fan. If Saudi Arabia is the Frangi and Russia are the old school Klingons, who is China? Come on. Nobody? Nobody has a guess? Is nobody here a Star Trek fan? Oh, Alex! Yes, I just looked at your name. I was like, Alex has to know this. Alex got it right. The Romulans. Damn right, the Romulans. They're the ones who could be good, but right now they have leadership that makes them kind of bad. But they're pragmatic, yet they're from time to time angry. Wolf warriors, right? That's what they are right now. And I think that at some point, China makes some pragmatic decisions. I think Chi makes them. You know, he's only got the rest of his life to figure this out. I think that China and the United States, in fact, make a deal here soon, pre-election, between Biden and Xi, where Biden gives in on some things, which is fine, because he's just going to give back things that he took away, right? The reason Biden's been so hard on China from day one is because you have to operate from a position of strength and say, look, neither one of us want a war. 
let's figure something out on technology. Let's figure something out on trade. Let's figure something out on finance so that we both win. Taiwan will clearly be a pawn in that. And by the way, you know, look, you're going to probably lose if you fight against me in the next election because women in America are going to vote Democrat for the most part, 70%-ish or something. So if you fight me and mess with me during this election cycle and I win, I'm going to jam it straight up your ass as payback. So why don't we figure this out today? I think it's going to be something like that. I will say in my lifetime, and I've studied this relationship since college, when I had a professor who was a dissident from China, I've told this story before. So if you've heard it already, I'm sorry, but it's a good story. I was one of the three or four undergrads who the professors loved because I kind of, for some unknown reason, understood geopolitics and mainly because I just read. You know, it's amazing what you learn when you read. And I had this professor from China um, who couldn't go back. Some of his family was stuck there. I don't know whatever happened. And he said, look, the Chinese will dangle a carrot over and over again and then just hit you over the head with a club when they're ready to. It's going to happen over and over again. It's been happening since the 70s. This was 1993-ish, 92-ish, might even been 91. And so I've watched and that's what happened. You know, American corporations go in there and get pilfered, get robbed. You know, they get funny legal complaints about them. So at some point, it became apparent to everybody that you couldn't just play nice with China all the time. You just had to stand up to them. Didn't have to bang the drum, didn't have to sing, didn't have to get in the newspaper a lot. You just had to start doing things that made it tough on them, made it hard for them to satisfy their people, who ultimately... Regardless of the Chinese military, I tell you what, if civil war ever broke out there, the communists would be out. And they know that. So they have to keep people happy. They have to increase standards of living, and they have to avoid a lot of um, military deaths, right? That's a lesson that Putin's learning right now. When you send somebody's kids off to die in a war, there's blowback. China knows that. China's way smarter than Putin. She's way smarter than Putin. Yeah, I think I, I'll still go by. I think Putin might be out by the end of this year. Anyway, I think there's a deal coming with China. I think it's a loose deal. I think it's good enough that the wolf warrior thing is put on the back burner and that the two biggest economies in the world start moving together to improve a lot of things. The Inflation Reduction Act is an example of that. For years, the United States did not do a whole lot to support clean energy. They let it get to the point that it was finally good enough to compete, and then they backed it with a huge, huge stimulus plan. It's all tied to clean energy for the most part. What did the UK say this morning? We're going to have to do something to offset that so that the United States doesn't get all that business. Europe, same thing, a couple months ago. Well, this IRA is a game changer. We're going to have to do something too. So if China, the United States, and ultimately India all start moving in a certain direction, and Europe and the UK and Japan and the emerging markets move in that direction, what happens? You get a lot of growth in the direction that they're moving, which is decarbonization. So that is still my favorite thing. But that doesn't mean that the emerging markets, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, don't want to hedge against the US dollar being such a strong adversary if it's weaponized by somebody. Again, I will tell you the Federal Reserve's job isn't to control inflation and drive full employment. It is to manipulate the dollar to the ends that benefit the country. Everything else is secondary or tertiary. So keep that in mind when you look at the big picture and when you watch the dollar and its relationship to the yen and other currencies, yuan, euro, right? Over 10 years ago, I said the euro would get to par with the dollar, got laughed at, got mocked. And here we are, they're at par, give or take. And it's going to stay that way, except when we feel threatened by outside inflation, which we just did. Inflation is coming down pretty quickly. Russia is starting to fight the battle by themselves. They just cut oil production. Saudi Arabia said that OPEC was going to. It doesn't look like they're really going to. So here we are in this energy transition, this fourth industrial revolution that's centered on AI at the moment, a space revolution, which we're going to talk about extensively next week, and all these other things that are coming. A reset in real estate that's happening right now, right before your eyes, is going to last a year or two. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to talk to the private equity firm and uh, get you the details. But I will say that this lovely woman is joining Keller Williams as a real estate agent. And the reasons that she's doing it are multifold. First off, I spent a decade trying to get myself into a position where I could travel a lot and see clients and just travel a lot. 
we had a talk about a month ago. And I said, look, do you really want to get back into corporate America? She said, no, I really don't. I said, we don't need you to have a paycheck right now. That's like a weekly thing. We need you to make your money enough for us to throw even more at real estate. And we want to buy real estate, right? We, we might end up with two, three, four properties, plus some development stuff. Why don't you just get into real estate? And we talked about it. She's like, yeah, no, nah, I've been thinking about that for over a year. I'm like, just do it. Do Keller Williams, which has a great training program and offices all over the world, Canada, the United States in particular, because then she can do certain things with her practice that are unique. Not just going to be a local real estate agent. She's going to focus on relocations for retirees, right? People who want to snowbird it to the South. We're going to focus on Arizona and Nevada, particularly Nevada and climate change relocation. I cannot tell you how many people that I've talked to from around the country are like, I worry about living in Florida. I worry about living in the desert. And the folks in California, they're already on board with this for the most part. And they know that the arbitrage, right? The cost of living and the cost of real estate from California to Wisconsin right now, you can buy three times as much in Wisconsin versus what you can buy in California. Literally three times. What does a million dollars get you anywhere within spitting distance of the ocean? What does a million dollars get you? Think about that. If you're in California or you've been to California or you look on realtor.com, just look at what a million dollars gets you. Here's what a million dollars gets near me. Probably gets you a lake view. Probably gets you at least a quarter acre if you're on the lake or a half acre to two acres if you're just near the lake, right? You're like walking distance or you know, close enough to go launch a boat. If you're not right on top of water, which is, you know, 50-50 around me in Wisconsin, Wisconsin has more lakes than Minnesota and these two big ones, Superior and Michigan, right? You can get five acres with a four bedroom, three bathroom house within a half an hour of the cities. So it's amazing what a million bucks will buy near me. A half a million bucks is still pretty good. You're still going to get three bedrooms, two baths, 1,600 square feet, on a half acre, suburban living. City living, you get a lot of quarter acres and eighth acres. So this theme of how the world is moving, I just, I tell the story over and over again in different ways because I want it to click for everybody. And I hope it does. All right, so let's finish with a Metis. Shooter also has the primary waves for stocks every week, which will be going up on margin of safety. And the new stocks of the week article is basically going to do the fundamental and catalyst side of the stocks to start to show technical support. So when the technicals start to move the way we want them to, I will remind us why these stocks are important. Ametis had a press release today. Stock is up 10 or 15% at the moment. And it talks about the tax credits. And those are all starting to fall in line. So I hope that I convinced you to buy stock last week or the week before. So they're going to have multiple revenue streams from the renewable fuels. This isn't even talking about the jet fuel yet. By the way, SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuel, I think is what that stands for. I'm going to stop calling it that. I'm going to start calling it air biofuel. Why am I going to call it air biofuel? Well, one of the days in Arizona was 100 degrees and we had two hours to kill. So we went and saw the air movie, the Air Jordan movie. It was actually really good. More importantly, it was air conditioned. <laughs> so we just sat in the dark and the air conditioning and we watched that movie. But I was thinking jet bio biofuel, nah, jet biofuel is not really yet. I'm going to call it air biofuel. That's going to be my term for it, air biofuel. So we will attribute the success uh, of Ametis and all the other um, SAF companies to, you know, Michael Jordan, might as well, right? Anyway, air biofuel is coming next. They're talking about the renewable natural gas right now. And what you can see is that they're going to start dropping a lot of revenue in the third quarter because all the tax rules are being finalized. So this is the first one. There's one more coming from the IRS, and they're probably going to drop 50 plus million dollars to the bottom line this year, which is what everybody asked for. Where's the cash? Here you go. So the short squeeze is probably on. And I want to point out that the money they have dropping to the bottom line this year is based on seven uh, dairy gas digesters. They're going to end up with 31 more, probably in the next year or two. But the Central Valley has enough farms that are within range of the pipelines that this number could go well over 100 in the next few years. So you just keep dropping more and more money to the bottom line. And I will tell you, something hit the news also last night, I believe it was, it might have been this morning. And it was that the Permian Basin probably hit peak production this year. It might have one more small increase next year, 
But the problem they're having is not only the high grading, I told you about that, they've already got the easiest oil and gas, and the gas keeps flowing in much longer than the oil because of the fracking, but they're running out of places to store the wastewater, which is 10 times more salty than ocean water. So they have to contain it, and they're just running out of places to do it. So oil production in the Permian probably peaks this year or next year. We know that all the other production is starting to fall. We also know that oil demand in general probably doesn't fall till 2030-ish. So there's a period of time where the companies that can produce oil and gas are going to do very well. And all these new biofuel companies are really going to do well because they get a tax credit too. So they're competing with the, the, the native uh, and traditional fossil fuel producers whose business is getting tougher, but they're getting tax breaks to compete with them. Well, do you want to invest in a company that gets tax breaks or the one that doesn't if they're producing roughly the same thing? Occidental, Chevron, Exxon all have the ability to do a lot of carbon capture. So does Conoco and a number of others. So carbon capture, that part of the Inflation Reduction Act, is there to support the energy transition by making sure that the big producers keep producing and they take part in climate change mitigation. It's interesting to me that the companies that caused a lot of the climate change are now being subsidized to help get rid of it. Kind of perverse, but from a pragmatic standpoint, probably had to be done. So I would keep an eye on this whole big picture, but I do think, this is why I had the charts up here. This is the one chart, and I'll show you shooters too if he has it up. If you're an ETF investor, if this has one more pullback on the price of oil dropping to 70-ish, I think we probably have to buy it. I don't think this bottom fishing is probably right anymore. And I'm not positive where I need to move it to. Right about there seems to be the spot, right? So if I move it up to there, that was a natural resistance level. Should probably be support now. That's also where a whole lot of uh, volume was taking place. So it probably moves up. So I think that probably 60-ish is your bottom fishing now. And it's hard to tell, right? Because the volume doesn't change in here very much. I think that spot right there, it might even be up here. So uh, I'm not sure if you understand what I'm doing. But right here, right? That spot right there. <clears throat> that surge in volume right here. Could it break through there? Yeah, it could. If it does, then it probably goes all the way down here. And I think this price right around 70, probably a must buy. And if you can sell cash secured puts to like 75 and get five bucks for them, I think that'll be on the sheet next week. That's probably what you want to do. And if you have to hold your breath because there's a recession, it goes down to 60, that's fine. Then you buy more. If the end of the world happens, I just don't see any end of the world stuff out there. But again, if the end of the world happens, then you just deal with it when it happens. So I don't know that a lot of these things make a difference anymore. I do think that this is probably where I want to be. Push us back to right here, 2014. Why there? Because that's when they flooded the market with oil. So I think that a pullback to 70-ish is probably the buy, unless we have something horrible going on in the economy. Then it's probably 60, and then, you know, end of the world. All right. So I will get that out there too. But in the meantime, I don't think you've missed it on a Metis. You know, this is a big day. You know, put it in an order for 225 and you'll probably get it tomorrow on a pullback. Sell puts. You know, our I think our call options probably are very profitable as of right now that we bought a couple weeks ago. Right? All right. All right, everybody. Take care and uh, apologize for being scratchy today. Hopefully I'm better on Monday. And we'll have the new Stocks of the Week, which uh, follows from the technical analysis by Shooter and myself but you know shooter does technical analysis every minute of every day so we're gonna give him the lead on that and uh work from him a little bit more uh, so that the fundamental and quantitative and the technical all work together because i think as long as we get over the rhetoric and the constant fear and all the narratives and that's actually going to be my new piece uh it's going to be called narrative trends i don't know if i want to put it out one, two, or three times a week, but it'll be something along those lines, probably just whenever I need to. But it'll be an update at the end of the day, um, probably twice a week, would be my guess. I won't put it out on Monday because all the other stuff comes out on Sunday and Monday. Um, but in the middle of the week, we'll probably get a couple updates, at least one called Narrative Trends, which talks about stocks that have moved and why the market did funny things that day. Because I know you all want to know what I think, because I get that question all the time. What do you think about this? So I'm just going to have a regular, what do you think about this article 
called narrative trends because usually it's a narrative that's driving something and usually we can ignore it, but we need to understand it first. And every now and then, every now and then, there's something that's important to really pay attention to. All right, look for the pullback here. One last pullback because of the negatives on oil. But I think a month or two out, you probably get a pretty strong oil story again. Uh, and that'll be good for a Metis too. So, all right, everybody have a great day. I'll, I'll talk to you Monday. I'm going to write a lot this weekend and get my flowers out. All right, take care.